Can we really recycle everything? Yes, we can. Here's how. In this presentation, we're going to see what's needed to make it happen. We're going to jettison current assumptions that prevent change. We're going to take a trip into the world of industry and science, and we're going to explore breakthrough ideas. I'm Janet Unruh, and I'm the founder of the Institute for Material Sustainability. Our website is www.rebk.org. So let me tell you just a little bit about my background. I'm an instructional designer. What that means is that I work with experts in industry to create training for new technologies and new methodologies, which are new ways of doing things. And for the past 10 years, I've been in manufacturing, chiefly at Daimler Trucks North America. I also have a Master's of Engineering and Technology Management from Portland State University. And I wrote the book, Recycle Everything, Why We Must, How We Can. And I've had a lifelong passion for the earth and its ecosystems. My journey and how I came to write the book began with the Engineering and Technology Management Program. And there we looked at designing and optimizing systems and business processes. In looking at these things, it reignited my interest in sustainability. I began to wonder, where are the sustainable systems? And so I searched for sustainable systems through all these books and uh, many more articles, websites, and so on, and I didn't find any. And so I decided to design some myself and finally wrote the book. Perhaps you're familiar with Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way that We Make Things by William McDonough and Michael Braungart. Now, this is one book that does talk about systems for recycling everything. However, it doesn't go as far as showing us what they could look like, which is what my book does. And so what I recommend is that you read this book and then read my book. You may also be familiar with the story of Stuff and Annie Leonard. She does a great job of raising awareness about the issues, but we're going to pick up where the story left off. First, a quick review of the situation. Most of us are aware of the giant piles of garbage that are mounting up all over this planet and in the oceans. But at the beginning of the process, we're also taking resources without much consideration for sustainability. Neither of these issues is a direct concern to industry. However, raw materials are critical to industry and to manufacturing. So we're going to take a quick look at two main problems for industry in regard to raw materials, cost and supply. This is a chart from Google Finance, and it shows the basic materials uh, represented by these companies in the lower part of the screen. And the top line here shows the uh, stock prices of these companies. The lower line shows the S&P 500. And so this chart compares the two. And in the middle here is the economic meltdown. And uh, one thing to look at here is the correlation between the high prices or at least the high stock uh, values of these companies and a perhaps negative effect on the rest of the economy. And the other thing to note is that once the um, economy begins to come back, as you can see over here on the far right, that uh, once again, basic materials outperforms the rest of the economy by at least 50%. And so the next consideration for industry is supply. And the question is, can materials keep on flowing? Well, there are various impacts on supply. There are such things as, of course, uh, price fluctuations and speculation. There is a decreasing quality and lower grades of ore that are available today. They take more technology and fuel to extract them. Resources are frequently in conflict areas or unfriendly countries. And at times there are sudden increases in demand from multiple industries for a particular resource. And of course war with weapons, bombs, vehicles, material, and uh, assorted things is itself a huge consumer of resources. Perhaps the uh, biggest resource of all, oil and petrochemicals, we are dependent on them, and uh, they have quite an effect on the entire economy. How much do we have left of the world's resources? We really need a global audit of resources, but this is difficult to do because of various unknowns. But it has been attempted, and uh, one of the best reports was written up in an article in New Scientist some time back, and it was titled, 
Earth's Natural Wealth and Audit. And uh, by the way, uh, this is referred to in the book if you want more detail. The report was based on information and data supplied by Dr. Armin Reller at the University of Augsburg in Germany and Dr. Thomas Gradle at Yale University. And you may recall his name. Uh, he's a co-author of this book, Industrial Ecology, which is a, a great one to read. The report also used data from the U.S. Geological Survey's annual reports and U.N. statistics on global population. Okay, I know this is a lot to take in, but this is a graphic that was supplied with the article in New Scientist's Earth's Natural Wealth and Audit. And it has a lot of things to look at here. And for a closer look at this graphic, please check my website at www.rebk.org. On the left, it shows the U.S. annual consumption per capita. And in the middle, this is a section that we're going to take a closer look at in just a second. And then in the upper right is a depiction of the proportion of consumption that is met by recycled materials. And in the lower right-hand corner is a depiction showing in blue the U.S. population and in red that's the rest of the world. So let's take a closer look at the center part of this graphic. So what this graphic is showing us is uh, two things. How many years are left to depletion for these various resources if the world continues to consume at today's rate? Or... How many years would be left if the rest of the world consumed at just half the rate of the U.S. consumption, which would mean that it would be an accelerated consumption rate? And so let's see how this works. So the lighter colored part of the, of, of the bar for each one of these resources shows today's rate of consumption, and the darker part of each bar shows the accelerated rate if the entire world were to come up to the level of consuming resources at just half of the U.S. rate. So I took this data and I put it into a table so it would be easier to read. Let's take a look at just a few of these. Uh, for example, copper. Copper, obviously, it's used in plumbing and electronics. If it uh, continues to be used and consumed at the current rate, uh, it will take 61 years to reach depletion. And if it is used at the accelerated rate, that would be 38 years to depletion. Let's look at another one. Gold, for example, uh, used in jewelry, dental, 45 years to depletion at the current rate and 36 at the accelerated rate. And I'm going to skip over indium for just a second. And let's look at silver, which is used in jewelry, catalytic converters, and uh, many other things. And at the current rate of consumption, would last 29 years, and uh, at the accelerated rate, it would last nine years. And another popular one is tantalum, which is used for cell phones, camera lenses, aerospace technologies, lots of things. And uh, at the current rate of consumption, it would last 116 years, and at the accelerated rate, 20 years. So let's go to indium now. Indium is interesting because it's used for medical imaging flat panel TVs, nuclear, and uh, all kinds of high-tech products. And this one was uh, perhaps the most um, shocking because at the current rate of consumption, it would be exhausted in 13 years, or at the accelerated rate, it would be used up in four years. And so this sent quite a shockwave through the industry, and uh, there was uh, quite a reaction Shortly after the article came out, the Indium Corporation, speaking on behalf of the industry, came out with this announcement, and they say on their website, the Indium Corporation is confident of the sustained Indium metal supply. And they go on to say, there has been concern expressed that the world may face an Indium shortage given the rising price environment experienced this year. The Indium Corporation believes that the temporary imbalance between supply and demand will be corrected and that sufficient indium is available to meet forecasted demand. In detail, they say, short-term shortages have periodically occurred because global production and usage are so finely balanced. And I reinterpreted that in this way. We can hardly produce it fast enough to keep up with demand. To continue quoting them, however, these shortages have historically been corrected by increasing refining capacity and ultimately supply. 
and I reinterpreted that somewhat. We're taking care of the problem by expanding our ability to produce it faster and in greater quantities. And so we can see from this that the industry reacted by avoiding any commentary on how much is actually left. And so when we see numbers such as these, it can be very shocking to consider that in really uh, just uh, in some cases a few years or a few decades, we would actually deplete these entire resources. At some point, countries may go to war to obtain certain resources. And as a matter of fact, uh, a book has been written about this by Michael T. Clare called Resource Wars. And its thesis is that as resources become depleted, countries will go to war to obtain them. And so recycling is an urgent matter, but for industry as well. Resource depletion could put industry out of business, and without resources, manufacturing could come to an end. Currently, the burden of recycling falls on consumers, local governments, and concerned nonprofits, all of whom are at the end of the process. Those who are at the end of the process have the least advantage in being able to do something about the issue, and yet many remarkable things are being done. So first, let's get a little clarification on what we mean by recycling. There are people who are doing upcycling, downcycling, free cycling, blended recycling, and what I call real recycling. Upcycling. This refers to waste materials that are made into products. As you can see here, this company TerraCycle does a fabulous job of taking uh, waste products such as candy wrappers and drink pouches and that sort of thing and making new products out of them. However, after the second use, these products are discarded. We use the term downcycling to refer to used products that are made into something else of lesser value such as filler of some kind or possibly fuel. After the second use, they are discarded. So examples are plastic milk jugs that are made into insulated coat filler, used running shoes that are made into rubber flooring, and used tires that are made into sandals. Free cycling is something that is popular here in Portland, Oregon, as well as I'm sure many other places. And this is essentially a kind of swap meet where people trade used uh, products from around the house and household items. Many times people confuse recycling with what I call blended recycling, in which materials from used products are processed with the addition of new raw materials to bolster their quality. So examples of this are recycled steel, aluminum, and paper. And the reason that they have to have new raw materials is because if only the feedstock from the used materials were to be used to produce a new product, its quality would be inferior. So let's look at real recycling. Real recycling means that everything that is manufactured or built should be 100% recyclable. Real recycling means that materials are recovered and reused for the same or similar products for an indefinite number of times. That's something to think about. This is the type of recycling that we're gonna focus on in this presentation. Our goal is to recycle the materials in cars, trucks, airplanes, furniture, essentially everything. And so the question is, can we reuse these materials to make the same or similar products countless times into the future? I believe the answer is yes. And so the next question is this, what would it take to recycle everything? And basically, I believe it would take five main things. Sustainable systems, recyclable materials, design for disassembly, new mindset, and people. Please continue to part two, and we'll look at sustainable systems.